him, great is thy faithfulness. I pray that you, you will see new mercies in the new year, the new mercies, loving, his loving kindness uh, will be to, towards you throughout this year. So we will start a new series this morning in the third book of John. And thank you all for the, for the scripture reading. And uh, this is that time of the year when people make resolutions. How many of you that made resolutions to eat more salads? <laughs> eat more, you know, uh, to exercise more, to lose weight, or to eat healthier, or even to save more money. And uh, the, the, the two most popular uh, New Year's resolutions are to exercise more and to save more money. And, and this is also a time uh, when people express their wishes to, to their family and friends. Uh, you would hear people say, may this year be filled with health, prosperity, and peace. Health and wealth are all prosperity are the most common wishes. And today, we'll, as I said, we'll start a new series uh, related to those two most common wishes in the third book of John. And many Christians used this text from third John chapter verse two to support this unbiblical teaching that it is God's will for all his children to be wealthy and healthy. And since the text says, beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. Many have fallen for this unbiblical teaching if you are neither wealthy or healthy, it is because you are lacking faith. Or because you are not a child of God, or you have sin in your life, or you are, you are cursed. These false teachers boldly appeal to the greed and selfishness of their spiritually naive listeners. And there are those of whom Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 6, who suppose that godliness is a means of financial gain. If these false teachers would bother to read 3 John verse 2 carefully, they would see that it really pronounces a curse, not a blessing among, uh, on them. And John is praying for his friend, guys, that he would prosper and be in good physical health to the same degree as his soul actually was prospering. He prays that Guy's physical health would match his spiritual health. And the health wish is a standard feature of the first century epistolary format, but has been extended by the author here to include not only a wish for physical health, but for spiritual health as well. And it is the spiritual health, which is the, to be the standard by which uh, one's physical health is measured, and not the other way around. And at the very least, it is dangerous when a Christian's material prosperity gets ahead of his spiritual prosperity. Paul warned in 1 Timothy 6, but those who want to get rich fall into the, the temptation and a snare for and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. And for the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves when meet with many griefs. And the apostle say, John said in verse 4, I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth, not, not prospering financially, 
he was saying he was he, he was uh, of course he was talking about his spiritual children but Christians parents uh, should be able to say about their children that their greatest joy is to hear their children are walking in the faith and parents or grandparents should be happy if their kids decide to be missionaries and our main focus and our main prayer for our children or grandchildren or for every Christian should be that they have prosperous souls so what are the characteristics of a prosperous soul and what does a prosperous or successful soul look like in this text John describes for us the prosperous soul and the prosperous soul is a soul that works in the truth and love submits to apostolic authority and imitates godly examples follow godly examples and the, the easiest way to highlight this letter is just highlighted by the four people you have the apostle john the last living apostle who wrote that letter and gaius the one who gave hospitality Diotrephus, the one who refused hospitality, and Demetrius, the one who is to receive hospitality. Instead of doing that, uh, we'll do something different and more interesting. So that is so obvious. People can see that. You see the four people. You see guys, Paul, guys, Diotrephus, and Demetrius. But we'll look at the we'll look at first the context of this text, and then focus on on the characteristic of a prosperous soul and finally compare a, pro a prosperous soul with an impoverished, miserable, or destitute soul. And now let's begin with the context of this letter. And if you have the, 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 button, the button insert, you can follow with me with the sermon notes so you have it in your, in your button insert. Let's begin with the context of this letter. When we are now in the last decade of the first century AD. And as we saw when we studied Second John, in the ancient world, hospitality was a necessity. And they didn't have all the fancy hotels and motels and inns and resorts that we have today for people to stay in. They didn't have that. And people were largely dependent upon somebody opening their homes to them. On the day, you remember on the day of, of, the, of, of Pentecost, they will, you had all kinds of pilgrims in Jerusalem who had come to celebrate Passover and they stayed through Pentecost and when Peter preached, 3,000 of them were saved. You remember that in the book of Acts. And 3,000 of them brought into the church of Jesus Christ, and that was the only church that existed on, the pla on planet Earth at that time. And they didn't want to go back to where they came from because they now they, they were part of the body of Christ, and the only place they could meet and fellowship was there with the apostles in Jerusalem. You remember in the book of Acts. And so the church there, those that had come to Christ prior to the day of the Pentecost, you remember the 120 in the upper room. And now those who came to Christ on the day of Pentecost had to absorb all those believers and care for them and meet their needs. And that's why later on, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, took a collection in order to help the church support the strangers who never, who never went back to where they came from because their new reason to live was singularly located in Jerusalem. And from then on, and as the church expanded, moved, and grew from city to city, 
town to town, places to places, believers began to move and travel, and itinerant preachers did the same. And they had to be embraced by the believers who were in every place and be given a home to rest in with food and support. And that is why when we look at the New Testament, we see this emphasis on hospitality. And you have it in 1 Peter 4, verse 9. Peter said, be hospitable to one another without complaint. And the Greek word for hospitality is love strangers. It's just basic to the Christian responsibility to open our home to those we don't know, particularly other believers who are strangers to us. In Romans 12, verse 13, it says we are to be practicing hospitality. In 1 Timothy 3, verse 2, Paul said, you have the qualifications for an elder, and the qualifications for an elder include this very directive. You are to be an overseer, above reproach, the husband of one wife, gentle, prudent, respect, uh, respectable, hospitable. And in, uh, Paul said that in Titus 1, verse 8, it says the same thing, they have to be hospitable. Elders, pastors, Shepherds needed to be the first to open their homes to, to, uh, to embrace strangers in order to set the pace for everybody else. And this was a basic responsibility, a basic expression of Christian love. In fact, let me give you an idea. In fact, uh, in the early church, the home was the center of everything. Absolutely everything when you have the home. As we read the New Testament, we don't find any church, build, any church uh, buildings. You, you will not find that in the New Testament. And we finish the New Testament, and there hasn't been a church building yet. They met in homes for prayer, for fellowship, to have the Lord's Supper. They met in homes for teaching, they even met in homes for preaching. Everything happened in the home. And so in the, the home was the church and the place that they gathered. And so it was very natural for them to open their homes to the traveling believers who came their way, even though they didn't know them. So by the way, even in, in the, the secular side, hospitality was really a duty. And strangers were supposedly under the protection of Zeus Xenius, who, who was known to, um, to them as the god of strangers. And uh, Xenos means a stranger. And the ancient world understood that, and they were, was, uh, for them, uh, there was a deity in their own mind that was sort of, of a sign to take care of, of strangers. This is what they, they, they thought. And if they wanted to, to have that duty on, on their side and not against them, they needed to be kind to strangers. So if the pagans did that, how much more, importantly, should the Christians do that? So uh, let's go back to our text. So the, the major concern here of Third John, and like a Second John, is hospitality. And this time, instead of discouraging hospitality to false teachers, you remember that in Second John, John now wants to encourage um, hospitality for traveling missionaries who speak the truth. So he contrasts one, one man's inhospitable actions, diatrophies, with another's faithfulness, uh, guys. And in the process, he demonstrates the need for godly leadership like his own. So, in other words, Second John, in Second John, he says, we have to be very careful who we welcome in because the truth is the essential ground on which your hospitality is built. 
And hospitality is a form of Christian love, and we are called to Christian love, to love other Christians in a unique, special, and embracing way. But we have to be very careful. And that was, that was, that was uh, the, the message in Second John. So Second John is sort of the negative, rule not to receive, and third John is the positive, who to receive. And as uh, together, and so together we get a great insight into how to deal with those who say they represent Christ and who come to us for support and help. And they are, we, in other words, they are those we, we reject, they are those who we accept. And the themes are always the same, truth and love, truth and love. So now let's look at, uh, let me give you a brief overview of what's going on there before we look at the characteristics of a prosperous soul. Third John is slightly uh, shorter than second John and is the shortest book in the Greek New Testament. So unlike, unlike the second John, which I believe was written to a local church, uh, third John is written to an individual named Gaius. And this is John's most personal letter. In fact, it is so personal, one might wonder why it ended up in the canon of scripture. And the answer becomes, clear once the message unfolds. Again, you can see the, the emphasis here on the truth. And some form of the, of, of the word truth appears seven times. You see, uh, the Greek word aletheia, which means a truth. And everything in the church is, is, is always built on the truth. John loves in the truth. He affirms the importance of bearing witness to the truth, of walking in the truth, of being fellow workers with the truth, of receiving a good testimony from the truth. So contrary to, to the first and second John, the primary issue behind this letter is not false teachers. In second John, and second John, he was dealing with the false teachers, but now he's not dealing with the false teachers. Instead, there seems to be some, some kind of power struggle in the church. A self-willed, power-hungry man, Diotrephus, had grabbed power, and he openly attacked the authority of the apostle John, and he denied hospitality to traveling Christian workers and he even excommunicated those who defied him by offering hospitality to these workers. I could imagine that Archiefist would say, you're fired. And he'd he get, get them out of the church. He excommunicated them because they did not agree with them. And that Archiefist has try to take control, and you will see in verse nine, uh, John describes him as the one who loves to be the first. He was arrogant. And while all those such guys are walking in the truth. So John was, he, John clearly, he has some kind of authority over this community. He's attempting to straighten out to straighten out this issue from afar. Don't, don't keep in mind, John is not, is not, is not at that church, he is, is so far. So he rebukes that, that church for refusing to acknowledge his authority or to welcome his fellow ministers. So he responds, you know, um, in, in response to this situation, John has sent a, a man named uh, Demetrius to represent him, but the letter says that he might come himself in verse 10. And Gaius, however, to this point, had resisted the strong arm tactics of Diotrephus. So he had given hospitality and, and financial support to these traveling missionaries, and John encourages him to continue doing so. And he sent Demetrius to him, who was probably the bearer of this letter. 
So John assured Gaius that he will deal publicly with Diotrephes when he visits the church in the near future. So I'm sure that it would be very interesting to have a box seat to watch the fireworks what, that, when that happened between John and Diotrephes. So now, um, now we'll, we'll look at the text. The prosperous soul, what does it look like uh, a, a prosperous soul? A prosperous soul, is a, John made it clear, a prosperous soul is a soul that walks in the truth and love. And he gave Gaius as an example. Beloved, it's a word that he will use. First he, start, he, he starts by saying the elder. The elder, uh, he's the old, uh, old apostle. He's who he is, he's, everybody knows him. He's the only one still alive. And he, he said, it's me, the old apostle to the beloved guys whom I love in the truth. In your translation, you will see dear friend, but some translations you will see beloved. And we know, we know nothing about guys or the other two individuals mentioned here in the text, except we learn what we learn here. And Gaius was a faithful man, a faithful Christian leader in a local church that was under the care of the Apostle John. And Gaius uh, was one of the most common names in the Roman Empire. And uh, if you read the New Testament, you will notice there are a number of men named Gaius and there was a guy from Corinth who was the host of Paul in the church of Corinth. It's, that, that was not the guys that we, are, we, we, we see here. And there, there was guys of Macedonia, a guy of a town called Derby. And these are not the guys being addressed here. And there is no way to identify this man in particular. He was some a leader in the church community in Asia Minor, what we call a modern Tur Turkey, and where John lived in his later life. And visiting preachers, evangelists, had stayed with him, and he was highly respected and beloved. Know that by all who knew him. And that's why he is addressed this way, the elder to the beloved guys. And the beloved, uh, from the word agapetos, agapao, the noblest kind of love, the highest kind of love, beloved, to the guys whom I love in the truth, beloved guys. And this simply identifies his familiar character. Everybody loved him. He was loved by the community. He was the beloved guys. He was a man of love. He was not only loved by, by the community, but he was loved by God. And John adds immediately in verse 1, whom I love, but he qualifies it. In what? In truth. And the truth was the sphere in which their love existed. And we can go anywhere in the world and find strangers that we have never met. But if they love the truth, there is a bound, there is a magnetism that draws us together with a divine force. Love and truth are inseparable. And love is built upon truth. Truth always governs the exercise of love. And that's why he's spoken of in verse, let, let's, let's look at in verse one, to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Verse three, it gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell about your faithfulness to the truth, to the Aletheia. In verse four, I have no greater joy than to hear my children are working in the Aletheia, in the truth. Verse 8, we are therefore to show hospitality to such men that we may work together for the truth. Verse 12, Demetrius is well spoken by every, everybody, everyone, and even by the th truth itself. And they were both in the truth. 
Now, we are all to, to love all people in the world in an evangelistic way, and we are to love them in the sense that we care about their souls the way God loves the world. There is no, no doubt about that. But that's not what we are talking about here. We are talking about here about a love that is unique to those who are in Christ, in the truth, in Christ. A special love, a unique, a unique love, a unique bound, a family love among Christians. Beloved. It's personal, my beloved guys. And then in verse 5, he says it again, beloved. And then in verse 11, he repeats it again, beloved. And he cannot stop saying beloved when he talks in this letter to this man, guys. He loved them. And what he tells us is that, is that guys was committed to the truth because John was also committed to the truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper in, in good health just as your soul prospers. And that is a word that refers to a state of well-being. And by the way, that statement that you may prosper, be in good health, is found in a lot of ancient letters frequently and doesn't necessarily mean that Gaius was ill but it was just well wishing. It was just well wishing. And he was, he was really saying, I pray that you are in a good health just as your soul prospers. And that's a gracious and kind affirmation of one's concern for well being. I just want, in everything that you would prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. And this is the greatest insight we could have into Gaius. He has a prosperous soul. And the word prosper means a successful, he has a successful spiritual life. And that's the idea. He's flourishing spiritually. And it, it's the same term used in Titus chapter 1 verse 13 uh, when Paul said, and it, 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 it translated a sound in the faith when he said uh, Titus you are in the faith in Titus 1 verse 13 he has a spiritual health and John says I would wish that your physical health would be as good as your spiritual health and that's a good prayer it's a very good prayer I think we pray more often for people's physical ill than we do for their spiritual health well, the inner life of Gaius was strong. He was prospering spiritually, robust, and, he, and, and prospering. And John, had it. He, John heard it about it. He heard about the prosperity of his soul. He knew about it. He knew him. He wishes the same blessing for his physical life. And that does lead me to say that God is concerned about, about your physical health. He really is. And back in Genesis chapter 2, 7, it's a very good point. If you go back to Genesis chapter 7, you will see God did not make a body and put a soul into it like a letter into an envelope of dust. He formed, rather, he formed man's body from the dust then by breathing his divine breath into it, he made the body of dust live. So the dust did not embody a soul, it became a soul. That's why you have, we are a living soul, a living being, a whole creature. God cares for your whole being, spiritual and physical life. So why did the aged apostle Paul so much put so much emphasis on the truth? And one reason was that he was the last living apostle and he saw numerous creeping errors into the churches. Also the Lord had repeated, repeatedly repeatedly emphasis and put so much emphasis on, on the truth in his earthly ministry. 
You remember in John 1, 14, John testified that Jesus was full of grace. He was full of grace, of, 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 of grace and truth. In John 3, 21, he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. In John 4, 23, Jesus explained that the Father seeks those who worship in spirit and truth. In John 8, verse 32, Jesus said, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. John 14, 6, Jesus claimed, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as the spirit of truth. And he prayed, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And Jesus told the skeptical Pilate, for this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So truth was a huge emphasis in Jesus' ministry, and therefore, too, in, in the life and ministry of the Apostle John. And contrary to the current postmodern philosophy that denies absolute truth in the spiritual realm, the Bible clearly affirms that there is theological moral truth. And the truth centers in the person and work of Jesus Christ, who is the God of truth in human flesh. And since God is the author of truth, and whereas Satan is the author of spiritual lies, and God's people must not, if, if, you know, we need to know the truth and obey the truth as revealed in God's word. And guys prospered in his soul because he walked in the truth. He stayed in the truth. And also those who had visited Gaius reported back to John Gaius', Gaius love before the church. And as we have seen, truth and love must always go together. And Gaius' good example teaches us about the, this essential virtues, truth and love. And first, to walk in the truth implies knowing the truth. Because before you walk, you need to know the truth. And guys didn't accidentally stumble onto the path called the truth and just as accidentally stay on it. And no one in this world, under the dominion of the father of lies and deceit, walks in the truth accidentally. First, it requires divine intervention. And then deliberate purpose and effort both to understand the truth and to walk in it. And the huge emphasis on truth in John's writings teaches us that truth matters. Friends, truth matters. And how a person thinks about God, man, salvation, and life determines how that person lives. And Solomon said, as a man thinketh, so is he. So a person with, with false concepts in these areas will live differently than the person with a biblical view. It's very pretty clear. And, and since Jesus himself is the truth, and since God's word is truth, Satan works over time to undermine the truth about the person and work of Jesus Christ and the truth of God's in, 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 inherent word. And this is his job. Satan try, is, is trying to undermine the truth about, the, about Jesus Christ. He doesn't want you to know Christ. He doesn't want to, to know and to grow in the knowledge of the Son of God. And, but there is an immense danger, immense danger as we go in our knowledge of the truth. Very big, big danger. And Paul said, knowledge puffs up, but it puffs up, you know, inflates up. It inflates us, but love builds us. If Satan cannot prevent us from knowing the truth, 
Then he tries to to get up, you know, he tries to get up, puffed up, puffed up, you know, inflate us when we know something and we think that and we know better. We know we we we, we take pride in ourselves that we we know that we know things that others don't know. And we would be wrong to conclude that we should remain ignorant so that we can stay humble. But we should always remember that anything we know of the truth it is only because of God's grace. But, he had, but if he had not been gracious to us, we would still be in spiritual darkness. And to walk in the truth implies grow in the truth. And twice, you see in verse 3 and 4, John mentions walking in the truth. It doesn't say that we should sit and rest in the truth, but rather we should walk in truth. And walking implies steady movement in a pur in purpose, in purposeful direction. And my beloved sister Anita yesterday told me, it's, it's very wonderful, John, Apostle John wrote that because he knows that I, would, I won't be able to, to run because I, I can only walk. <laughs> and it requires discipline and effort. So uh, the Apostle John told us to, to walk in the truth. Walking is not as quick, you know, as quick as running, but if you keep at it, walking will get you where you are going. After warning about the danger of being carried away by the error of the unprincipled man, Peter commends us in 2 Peter 3, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You will not grow in the knowledge of Christ by accident. And you must purpose to walk in the truth, studying to learn and then apply God's truth to your daily life. Third one, growth in the truth should always result in love. As we've seen, truth and love are not opposed to one another. And John affirms that he loves guys in truth which means in the sphere of the truth about Jesus Christ. In verse 6, he affirms that Gaius, who is walking in the truth, is also known by, uh, for his love. He, he is, is known for his love. So often people, would, people who are big on the truth and use it as a club to wail on those who don't agree with them or those who emphasize love are soft on the truth, they end up being nice when they need to stand up for the truth. But since God is the God of truth and love, godly people will be character, uh, ca characterized by both truth and love. And sometimes, you know, love requires confronting a, a person who is a theological or moral error. And presumably, Diotrephus did not teach the, the errors of the heretics. Or John would have said something about it. But Diotrephus was a self-serving, unloving man. And John hit him very hard for these sins. And we must assume that the apostle of love was acting in love towards this, this sinning man. And of course, love not only confronts sin, love manifests itself in practical deeds, <coughs> practical good deeds. And the legation that we turn from visiting Gaius had testified of his love. And Gaius had welcomed them into his home, even though they had been strangers to him before their visit. He had treated them in a manner worthy of God. And when they left, he loaded them with supplies for their journey and with money for their mission. His love was not just talk. It showed him itself by treating others as he himself wished to be treated. As, as we've seen, being hospitable is one qualification for being an elder, but all believers are commanded to pursue hospitality in Romans 12, verse 13. So we are, both, we are to be a people 
zealous for good deeds. And biblical love isn't just feeling the warm fuzzies, it's, practi it's practical deeds, good deeds. And John writes of these missionaries, for they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. And these missionaries were not peddling the word of God, receiving donations from the unbelievers that they were seeking to reach. John says that God's people should support such workers, and in doing so, we, well, we, 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 we become fellow workers with the truth of the gospel that they proclaim. And one practical way for you to show Christ's love by good deeds is to help support missionaries who go out for the sake of his name. And the prosperous soul walks in the truth and in love. I'll conclude with that. As John encourages us, we should embrace the blessing of welcoming missionaries into our lives and our homes. We must then empower them to continue their efforts elsewhere. And we confirm that the, the know Christ, the know God, and we, we know also know God by our deeds, love, hospitality, and walking in the truth. Let me sum up everything what we just said in one application with the phrase, you probably, um, you, you have probably heard that phrase, you are what you eat, right? It is both spiritually and physically. It means that it, it is important to eat good food in order to be healthy and fit. But you can, the next, in the next two, three months, you will say, oh, I'm feeling more energetic because I've started eating more salad. Or, you know, uh, not burgers or not uh, other stuff, but more salad to be more, yeah, <laughs> energetic. But it's also important to, when you, when you will eat your salad, you will read the word of God for your soul to prosper. You know, that, that means you will, you will work and grow in the truth. And goals get us nowhere without the good habits we carry to achieve them. Your habits undermine your goals. And watch out how you feed yourself physically and spiritually. People who, who, you, you, who you associate yourself with can make, you, can make your soul prosper or destroy your, your, your soul. And that's what we will see next week. Uh, good examples matter. And if you want to be faithful followers of Christ, we need to be careful. We need to pay careful attention to our habits because we hand over much of our lives to our habits, much more than we probably realize. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Keep in mind that if you sow a thought, you will reap an act. If you sow an act, you will reap a habit. If you sow a habit, you will reap a character. So watch out. You are what you eat. Wishing you good health and prosperous soul in the new year. May the Lord bless you. Let's bow in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you again. Thank you for calling us again to, to the truth and calling to love one another, to embrace love and truth. Lord, we pray for our missionaries and we pray for our Susis in the in Guatemala and we pray for all the, we pray for others in, in, in every uh, different regions and we pray that you will strengthen them. You will give them your grace and please help us and help us to um, to support them, to support them with our words and with our uh, uh, money and for our financial resources that we will uh, proclaim your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.